During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. Everybody has unconscious biases, and people embed their own biases into technology. This kid got stopped as a result of facial recognition misidentification. And then used that as justification to search you. This is an innocent child. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. It's not just face classification, it's any data-centric technology. Every day, we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. The people who own the code deploy it on other people, and there is no accountability. Management at Atlantic Towers wanted to install the facial recognition software. Pretty much turned this place into Fort Knox. The technology is being rapidly adopted, and there are no safeguards. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. Technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. Show me that it's going to be fair, that it's legal, before you put it out. That's what we don't have yet. It's going to take people coming together, driving for justice in this age of automation. Welcome, everyone. I'm Margaret Honey, the president and CEO of the New York Hall of Science, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our seventh annual Supporting Women and Girls in STEM event. Thank you for joining us, and a special shout out to Cognizant for being our steadfast supporter of these events. A few brief words on what we do at NISI. We are a highly interactive and deeply engaging science center where young people and their families come to make, create, and explore. We're proud that Queens, the most culturally diverse community in the country, is our home. And we use our aspirational approach to STEM learning, which we call Design Make Play, to enable all young people to experience their agency as learners, makers, and creators. We invite all of you to come visit the museum when we reopen this summer. I hope that you all have had a chance to watch Shalini Kantaya's documentary, Coded Bias. If you weren't able to view the film, it will be airing on March 22nd at 10 p.m. on PBS's and WNET's Independent Lens program. Shalini is a filmmaker and a producer whose films include A Drop of Life and Catching the Sun. She is a Sundance Fellow, a TED Fellow, a Fulbright Scholar, and an associate of the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. She founded the production company Seventh Empire Media with the mission to create a culture of human rights and a sustainable planet through imaginative media that makes a real impact. Shalini is joined today by Namitha Luthra, who is a longtime friend of the New York Hall of Science and a passionate women's rights advocate. She serves on the board of directors of Monumental Women and on NYSI's President's Council. She also served on the board of directors of Saki for South Asian women. And she was a staff lawyer at the American Civil Liberties Union working on litigation, advocacy, and public education to advance the rights of women and girls. There, she co-authored a book called The Rights of Women and successfully litigated gender discrimination jury trials in federal court. As
As Namitha and Shalini engage in conversation today, please do use the chat and Q&A bunk. Um, Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. We really do want to hear from all of you. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Namitha. Hi, welcome Shalini. I join Margaret in welcoming you to the New York Hall of Science, albeit virtually. We'd love to have you out at Queens um, soon. Um, I also welcome all of our guests. We have with us today lawyers, data scientists, um, gender and race activists working in the United States and abroad. We also have um, college and high school students who are part of NYSI's explainer program and the youth development program. Um, so we look forward to your engagement and questions later in the program. Um, I know everyone's eager to get to a discussion of the film, as am I, but I just wanna say, a day after International Women's Day, what a thrill it is to be talking to another American woman of Indian descent about algorithms and machine learning as one does on a Tuesday. Um, and I can't tell Shalini if my, one of my favorite things about your film was that you interviewed nearly exclusively all women, experts, scholars, authors, who are doing the groundbreaking thinking in this area or if in review after review of your film, that fact didn't always go, uh, that went unnoticed. And isn't that just what we want, that women pursue whatever it is that they're passionate about, um, seek public office, private office, and achieve that, and that one day that won't be noteworthy. Um, but your interviewing nearly only women reminded me that when, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be asked, well, how many women do you want occupying seats of the Supreme Court? She would always say nine. Um, so, but speaking of women's paths and following them, tell us about your path to filmmaking. How and why did you choose it? Well, first of all, Namita, I just wanna say what an honor it is to be with you today. And I wanna thank um, um, all of the hard work that went behind the scenes. It's such an honor to speak with a human rights ad advocate in the context of supporting women and girls in STEM. Um, it is part of the change that I feel so passionately about. Um, I, um, I will, I will, I'll start by saying that three years ago, I didn't know what an algorithm was. <laughs> and everything I, I knew about um, artificial intelligence came from the imagination of Steven Spielberg. And I sort of um, stumbled down the rabbit hole when I read a book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, and subsequently saw a TED Talk by Joy Bellamwini, and began to see the way in which um, algorithms, machine learning, AI, is increasingly becoming a gatekeeper of opportunity in our society. Um, I wasn't aware of the way in which we are already outsourcing so many important decisions that govern opportunity and change the destinies of human beings, including you know, who gets hired, who gets into college, who gets healthcare, increasingly who gets the vaccine, um, how long a prison sentence someone may serve. And what I learned much through the work of Joy Bellamwini and Kathy O'Neill and so many of the sort of brilliant badass women in the film is that these very systems um, that we're entrusting with such important decisions have not been vetted for racial bias or for gender bias or for discrimination, sometimes not even vetted for some shared standard of accuracy outside of the company that stands to benefit economically from its deployment. And that's really when I began to see that we could roll back 50 years of civil rights advances um, in the name of, the, of machine neutrality and these black box algorithms. And um, that's sort of what set me on the journey to make the film. I 
I have to say, I didn't know what a revolutionary act it would be to make a film about future gazing technologies that feature um, mostly women and people of color. I often joke that my gender ratios are the same as most technology films, but when we see a film that is almost white men talking about technology, we've sort of been so conditioned to it that we have not, um, that we don't question it. And so I, I didn't realize that everyone would just be so uh, amazed <laughs> by the cast of the film. That being said, I didn't set out to make a film that was mostly women and people of color. I um, followed the research and the research kept bringing me back to these voices. And what I learned is that um, I think what the film is not only are they some of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met. Um, I think there's seven PhDs in the film. Um, I think Kathy O'Neill once tried to um, explain to me how she did the equation for pie into a sweater. <laughs> I mean, I only get half of what they say and half is a lot. Um, but I also had the experience of being marginalized, of um, having an identity that maybe wasn't centered. They were women, they were people of color, they were religious minorities, they were LGBTQ. And what I realized is that this is actually the community that is leading in ethics and AI. And so I think uh, the representation um, in Coded Bias is actually very representative of who is actually um, leading the fight for more ethics and more humanity in these technologies that will govern and define our future. Yeah, that all makes sense. I mean, so let's get to the film. Joy Bulamwini, she is a classic mythical hero of the kind that Joseph Campbell described. She's on a quest. She faces obstacles, she overcomes them, she comes full circle. We so rarely see women and black women in particular occupying that hero, hero role. We rarely see it in film or public statuary, which is the work that I've been doing recently. Um, she's really a superhero with her algorithmic Justice League shield and her cape. Um, when and how did you know that Joy would be the driver of this story? Well, I love the Joseph Campbell re reference because um, uh, his work, is, I actually have his book on my, uh, actually right here. <laughs> um, so the hero with a thousand faces is actually how I construct documentary. I sort of look, one of the things about documentary is that it reminds me that everyday people um, our heroes and can change the world. And, um, you know, I sort of started exploring these voices all at the same time. And it actually was not until Joy testified before Congress that I realized that I had the full arc of a, of a story because you have someone who starts as a graduate student um, and is basically trying to make the equivalent of a Snapchat filter work on her face, try, just trying to put Serena Williams' face um, on hers and, and, and do work that makes her happy for artistic sake and stumbles upon racial bias in uh, commercially available systems. And I thought what was so astounding about her discovery of racial bias is that this was not a technology that was sitting in a lab somewhere or being beta tested at MIT. This was a technology that was actively being sold to the FBI, actively being sold to ICE or immigration um, enforcement, uh, actively being sold to law enforcement. And when she testified before Congress, I knew that there was a full arc. And what I think is astounding to me is that three black women, um, scientists, all graduate students, all who probably got carded the last time they drank alcohol in a public place, um, because they, they're, they're you know, young, um, somehow identified racial bias in commercially available systems that, that somehow IBM, um, Amazon, and Microsoft missed. And that to me speaks to why inclusion is not just something that is good for the pictures. 
it is actually something that is integral um, to the deployment of technologies uh, globally that, that work on all of us and in us being able to innovate. And one of the things that I learned in the film was a little bit more compassion for us all because I think um, we're having this national conversation about bias and I think sometimes there's this impetus to say, oh, bias isn't a few bad people. It was just a few bad apples that have this sort of racial bias or gender bias or um, sort of in that way. And I think in the making of this film, what I realized is that bias is an innate human condition and we all have it regardless of where we come from. And so therefore we need scientists who are from um, backgrounds that represent our world that can help control and shine a light into each other's biases. And um, when you have an industry like AI, where women make up less than 14% of the researchers in 2020, which seems abysmal and unacceptable, um, we are missing the genius of half of the population. And I think that's why um, Black women scientists like Joy Bolamwini, uh, Dr. Timna Gebru, and Deborah Raji um, have shown us. Yes. Um, I found in your film there were so many pithy, profound gems, um, often delivered by Joy um, and Kathy and others. Joy said, Data is destiny. And that's really a profound, short way of saying it. She also said that the past dwells in our algorithms, which I think many people don't think because of this facade of neutrality. But one of the most profound statements came not from an expert or scholar for me, uh, but from Trené Moran, who is a tenant of the Brooklyn housing complex that you feature. And after management starts taking videotape of the premises and if something goes awry, then they print out the photos, circle the tenant's faces, write the apartment number next to them and slide it under your apartment door. And Trené says, sitting at her table, something about it just doesn't seem right. And I thought, Right there is that small voice that lives in each of us that steers us to right or wrong. Um, and it's one of the things that most essentially makes us human beings, that small voice. And to me, it seems like machines are light years away from capturing that feeling. And then if you contrast Trené's sentence with the young woman in China that you show us, um, who when she meets somebody brand new, would rather trust the government's um, social credit report scoring rather than her own instincts. When she's meeting somebody completely new and she doesn't know anything about them, she would rather trust that score than her own instinct. And I thought, oh boy, then we're really inside of Kathy O'Neill's dire warning that this is really algorithmic obedience training. Is that really what's happening to us? That the, the very things that make us human beings, those small instincts and listening to our internal voices are the very things that they're trying to take away? Mm. Wow, that was such an insightful question. <laughs> um, I think that I think that um, it's so poignant to me because um, Trené Moran speaks to. I think in the film, I explore what intelligence is in itself, and I am convinced that um, when the sum total of human knowledge is in a is in a uh, a machine learning system that what set what is actual intelligence is our ability to empathize our um, humanity our ability to empathize with someone radically different than us um, our our human feelings our moral instincts and I feel sometimes in this rush to efficiency 
that we're losing the goal of being humans. And I start to wonder, I think often when I talk to technologists, they say, oh, you just had some bad data and uh, we just need to fix the data set and we'll have the perfect algorithm and we'll just fix this all. And I think that to me, it's not about the perfect algorithm. It's actually about a more humane society. And this fundamental question of, is the goal of our existence to make it more efficient, to go as fast as we can? Um, or is it actually um, the, you know, um, the inherent value of every human being and how we honor that in the systems that we build? And I think that the, the, the you know, sort of dichotomy that you just set up says just that. And the irony of that is Trené Moran, who is in every definition, a hero. Um, here is someone who didn't know what biometric data was. And I see May Downs and Trené Moran, um, instead of just sort of saying, oh, we don't have any power to change this, start to organize with their friends and their neighbors. They're, each of them is, ha, has three generations living in that um, housing complex. And, um, and not only did they keep their landlord from installing invasive surveillance that was racially biased, but they also inspired the first ever legislation in New York to, that would protect other residents against the same kind of invasive surveillance. And, and I think that's incredible and speaks to the power of that little voice. And each person in the film who came outside the world of data science and mathematics, every, every sort of everyday person talked about their imposter syndrome. And, and I would put myself in that category um, in terms of feeling like, who are we to question these systems? We, we don't know math, this isn't our thing. I, I myself with all, all of my background um, was terrified that I was gonna have improper use of, of, of um, I was gonna use the word algorithms interchangeably with AI and someone was gonna discredit, discredit my research. And um, what role did I have at this table? And I think when it comes to AI, all the knowledge has been on one side. So all the power has been on one side. And I think that episode in China, which I think reads sort of like a, um, Black Mirror episode <laughs> inside of a documentary, I, it was so important for me to include. I, I think it's important to say that, you know, China, of course, doesn't have a free independent press and it would have been dangerous for someone um, to speak up against that facial recognition and social credit score system. But I think that we all feel like, oh, that's China. That's like a galaxy far, far away. And I think that for me, it's actually a Black Mirror episode that's this close to us. And I think we've all had moments where maybe we're not judging, maybe we Instagram stalk them or Facebook stalk them and judge them based on how many followers they have, how many likes they have, what's popular. And we all have this part of us that's inside of us that's like, oh my God, so cool. I just bought a candy bar with my face. <laughs> so convenient. <laughs> Um, you know, I could pay for dinner with my face. And, and so I think that it's actually a reality that is far closer to us than we think. And we have not begin, uh, begun to really grapple with the fact that democratic societies are picking up the tools of authoritarian states with essentially no lawmakers, no one that represents we the people um, in place. You know, I, I talked a little bit about um, how, you know, that facial recognition that was racially biased was already being sold to, to the FBI. There was a moment um, where I was watching Joy testify in Congress and I saw something I almost never saw, ever see on TV, which is, um, uh, Right, right wing uh, Trump supporting Republican from Ohio, Jim Jordan, agree with um, 
our Our Lady of Queens AOC, um, left wing Democrat, um, and say, well, wait a minute, 117 million Americans are in a police database that they can access without a warrant. And there's no one that we elected, no one that represents we, the people, governing, giving oversight to that usage. And that's when I began to see that, that, that we're just picking up these tools of authoritarian states um, without any um, democratic rules in place about how these technologies are governed. Right. Um, so let's then dive deeper into how facial recognition is applied or misapplied in the criminal justice context, um, leading to stops, searches, uh, police abuse, unwarranted arrest. Um, why were all of those segments of the film when we see the criminal justice context, why were all of those shot in London? Um, such a great question. Um, that is because we have no laws here in the US uh, there, and therefore there's no transparency at all. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not even sure that I could um, file a freedom of information request, a FOIA request and receive that information. We have essentially no laws, no transparency um, that the way it's being used in the US is completely opaque to me. And so I had to go to the UK where they have some framework to situate data rights in a civil rights framework. They have some um, framework to situate data rights in a, in, a, in a human rights framework. And so therefore, um, that process, the police trial of facial recognition was made transparent to human rights observers at Big Brother Watch. I was able to another group of local heroes, three people rolling back the, the, the use of um, the real time use of facial recognition by the London police. Um, and so that I could actually follow that and, and sort of discover those two moments, which I think are are two of the most chilling moments in the entire film. Um, I think I watched that scene of a black British child, uh, 14 years old, in school uniform, um, being stopped by five police officers. Even when I talk about it, it all, all the, the hair is standing up on my arms because um, it was so deeply disturbing. Um, even, even still when I watch it, it's so um, unfathomable to me. And the rage that sort of fills my body when I watch it, thinking about how I would react if five plainclothes police officers came at me when I was just going about my business on a New York street. Um, and if, if that child had reacted how I wanted to react, that that could have resulted in a fatality. And that was startling to me. And also because you see the child ask, why, why was I stopped? It was only because the human rights observer was there to explain to the child, this is why you've been stopped. And that to me is the kind of trauma you don't recover for, from, <laughs> that, that doesn't seem acceptable in a free society. And, the other moment is a moment where just an everyday citizen reads the signs of the protesters and, and tries to cover their face and, um, and is stopped and ticketed. And I thought, oh my goodness. And, and you see, I sort of make the comparison to South Africa to remind people that in free societies, we should not be arbitrarily stopped by the police. Um, and so, and our identity cards have to be shown to police arbitrarily. That's not what's supposed to happen in democratic societies. So that was really appalling um, to me that I could only get that information in the UK. Um, we don't know how this is being used in the US. Amazon was treating this technology, was treating law enforcement like the Avon lady in terms of um, selling these um, technologies to to law enforcement technologies like Ring. And um, 
What we do know is that the first ever case of someone wrongly stopped, uh, a Detroit man was stopped, um, arrested in front of his family and his neighbors. Again, the kind of humiliation you don't recover from easily. Um, held in a, in a cell for 30 hours and never asked for his license. And it, it, it came out quite by accident, again, because we don't have any laws that would protect this person, um, that he, he, it was wrongful identification by police use of facial recognition. And in spite of that, the Detroit police continues to use um, facial recognition. So to me, it's really imperative that we put some laws in place and some protections here in the US um, so that this system becomes more transparent to us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was going to ask another Kathy O'Neill quote, which is so um, well phrased, people who own the code deploy it on other people and there is no accountability. Accountability leads us right to uh, law, policy, regulation, what, what concrete steps can people who are here today take? Are there bills that we can support? Are there particular cities who are considering banning facial recognition? I know that list has grown um, over the past year, but what, what concrete steps can people here take today uh, to help stem the tide? I think it's a great question. And I really think there are two things that I would recommend. One is to act locally. I think that um, it says a lot that the first cities to ban um, facial recognition uh, by law enforcement and in their municipalities in, um, have been San Francisco, Oakland, Cambridge, Somerville, all technological hubs, places where, um, where um, people know how these systems work, have been the fit first to ban them, and that should tell us all how um, we all should be deploying these technologies. You can go to the codeadvice.com website and there's a take action page with a ton of heroes, including um, the ACLU of New York, um, is doing incredible work in the field. Um, 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 Lee is usually with us on a, on a bunch of things. I'm so proud to be partnered with them. And other groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and others, um, Mi Gente, the Algorithmic Justice League, who are all pushing for systematic change. Um, it's my belief, I, I think Letitia James is the one who put a bill in New York to ban uh, facial recognition in housing complexes that was inspired by the Brooklyn residents. We can support that bill. Um, so, you know, the tricky part about this is I think when people want um, to take action, they want me to say, oh, you just need to put a little tape over your lens and use blue jeans instead of uh, Zoom and you know, signal instead of WhatsApp and there, there are degrees of that. But it's something that we need systematic change around. And what I can say is I've seen a recipe of how social change happens. And I think that what I've seen is the power of um, independent science unencumbered by corporate interests. We need, I mean, uh, scientists like Joy Bellamini and Dr. Tinnit Gebru, these are brave scientists that put their academic reputations on the line to challenge multinational corporations and they need our support. And I think we need independent science because I see this pattern where big tech often attacks these scientists um, and tries attempts to discredit research about bias in AI before they they um, before they make changes, and so we need that independent science. We need science communicators. Um, I, I like to think that I hope that the film played a small role in in legislative change. Um, my favorite comments were, you know, my grandmother loved, loved your film, my 12 year old daughter loved your film. And that makes me feel um, so grateful because I want us to all feel like we have a place at the table and your 10 year old starts using this 
uh, in the fifth grade. And so I'm so passionate about the work that you're doing because at the moment we start using these technologies, we should start um, literacy. And on our take action page, we have an activist toolkit. We have a discussion guide that lays out some basic terms and definitions in the field. Um, and it's my belief that um, understanding how these systems work, what they can really do and what pseudoscience that uh, baloney companies are espousing to make profit, um, you know, we as a society need to start to question these things and be engaged. And the other thing is just engage citizenry, engage people of a democracy taking the streets. Um, in, you know, in the making of this film, I saw sea change that I never thought would, was possible. If you told me in 2018 that the three biggest multinational companies in the world would change their policy willingly on selling facial recognition to law enforcement, I would have thought, you're crazy, this is just unbelievable. And that happened in June, 2020, where IBM said they're getting out of the game, they won't deploy it. Microsoft said they'd put a one-year pause. And Am I, I'm sorry, Microsoft said that they would stop selling it to law enforcement. And Amazon said that they would put a one-year pause. We're good for like three more months on that. Um, but that happened in June, 2020. And that timing is really important because the research had been out for 18 months. But what happened in June 2020 was the largest movement for civil rights and equality that we've seen in 50 years. And what we had was engaged people in a democracy making the connection, partly because of the translation of this independent science between racially biased invasive surveillance technology in the hands of law enforcement and the inherent value of black life and the communities who are most brutalized um, by the disparate impact um, of these technologies. And um, because of that, we had the sea change. And that makes me feel like we really have a moonshot moment to push for ethics um, in technology and that we the people actually have more power than we think. Yes, absolutely. All of that is encouraging. It is really profound change. Um, so I saw this, Shalini, um, not that long ago, about a week and a half ago, that TikTok agreed to pay $92 million to settle a lawsuit accusing it of misusing artificial intelligence to track and store users' data. The group that challenged it saying that they're using software to recognize facial features in user videos algorithms that identify age, gender, and ethnicity. And then more than that, that they were then providing that user data to China. The only people I know, and maybe I skew differently, the only people I know who use TikTok are 13-year-olds. And so this is especially pernicious if it's really targeting children. But then it was really TikTok's response that gave me pause. They said, oh, no, no, we're trying to create a safe and joyful experience for our community. And safe and joyful and community all sound like such wholesome words. It made me think, are we walking in a hall of mirrors where nothing is really quite what it seems? Um, it's not safe or joyful but in fact that there's something sinister going on, is it? A fantastic question. And I think um, TikTok and the use of it really underscores the growing sort of um, distance between the front end, this sort of gamified front end of the technologies we're using um, that is about democratic youth culture. And then the other back end, which is about authoritarian surveillance. And what is concerning to me is that while there's been a lot of focus on TikTok, um, what TikTok is doing is kind of also very much what Facebook does every day of the week and twice on Sunday. <laughs> it, it is uh, very much in keeping with what's happening. I mean, um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal was all about 
these our our data being sort of being used to create these complete psychological profiles about us. Um, people always use the word privacy. I, I tend to like the word invasive surveillance. I think it's much more accurate. And it's the kind of, you know, whether it's TikTok or Facebook or Google, even Amazon. I mean, these companies have the kind of data about us that make the East German Stasi look like they had a life like the secret programs of COINTELPRO and the FBI in the 60s um, knew very little about us. <laughs> um, and these systems are being used um, in, in the case of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. You know, you have the 100,000 people that it's built a psychological profile about by name. And then targeted that hundred thousand people with misinformation to swing an election. Um, you know there is a um, you know a study that was published in Nature magazine that I cite in the film about how these small nudges in um, in 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 suggestion by Facebook could swing an election with nobody knowing how you know I voted with your friends icons. I just voted with no friends icons, a very subtle, almost imperceptible manipulation could swing an election and almost with no one knowing. And we've not yet begun to really grapple with it. And so I appreciate the dialogue that we're having about TikTok, but I also think that we run the risk of operating like an authoritarian state. I mean, whether that authoritarian state is run by a corporation or a state government, it doesn't make me feel that much safer. <laughs> and so I think that the TikTok um, sort of, this, this question that we're being asked should also help us reflect on our own use of these technologies at home. And also the mental health of children is something that we really need to consider a lot deeper in terms of these technologies. I don't think we've begun to look at not just the surveillance and what that's gonna happen when that person is you know, uh, 25 and their whole entire life has been online. And then you know, what's happening, I mean, Things like Asian kids it, 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 in, in, in neighborhoods where there are higher um, concentrations of Asian kids, they are getting higher, higher um, prices for SAT prep. In another community with um, Latinx kids, Latino, Latino kids, that, that they're getting predatory ads for the University of Phoenix. And what happens when you've been tracked your whole life? Um, based on your zip code and this sort of predatory ads are sort of coming at you. And so I, I don't feel, I think that it speaks to a whole reign of data protection that we need to protect children, um, particularly teenagers around um, their data. Thank you, Shalini. I have one last question that I'm going to turn it to Margaret for questions from the audience, which we're eager to hear. Um, this isn't your first film. You've made other great films. Is there anything percolating at the moment? Have you fallen down a new rabbit hole or um, are you content in this one, which has plenty of fodder for thought? Well, I will say that um, this is a field that will continue to fascinate my imagination. Um, I'm working on a sci-fi and I am working on a film in a similar fate space that I hope that there's a public announcement about in the next uh, couple of weeks. And it might be around something that you just mentioned. <laughs> okay, that's a great teaser. I will turn it now then to Margaret for audience questions. 
story. Um, thank you both. And, and <clears throat> Shalini, that's the perfect teaser. We will all be on the lookout. So um, we thank you, audience. We, um, we have a lot of great questions here, and um, we'll do our best to work through these. So I'm going to start um, with one that came in later because it, it really does pick up um, on what you were just talking about. So um, this question um, begins with the comment, you've mentioned how important it is to understand algorithms. How much of this um, do you think, um, Shalini, is an education problem? How much do you think education can increase algorithmic, computational, statistical literacy? Oh, well, I was just raised to believe that education is the most powerful tool that we have um, in our arsenal. And I, it's my deep belief that um, part of this issue that we're facing, I mean, we have, a, we have a system where you have a sitting senator questioning Mark Zuckerberg and saying, how does Facebook make money? And Mark Zuckerberg says, says to a sitting senator, um, we sell ads, Senator. <laughs> And that can't be allowed. <laughs> that just can't be allowed. Um, and, and it's my belief that that education has to come from the ground up. It has to come from we the people. And part of this is um, I really do believe that coding, um, the, the understanding of these algorithms, the way Google works, the more that we can start teaching that stuff, much in the way that you are doing um, by supporting women and girls in STEM, is um, is starting that education early um, in the fifth grade in elementary school. So they don't grow up thinking that this is this big magic that we can't question. It's, I know how that works. Oh, that's pseudoscience. Why did I just get that ad? Or why did I, when I spoke to the Grand Canyon, get um, in a private conversation with my colleague, then get a DM on my Instagram? Oh, my, my microphone and my camera was on. And so the more that we can start to teach that basic literacy about how these systems work, about how algorithms work. I mean, um, for me, there was just such a huge learning gap. Um, I myself couldn't talk to people at parties because I was so worried that they were ask, would ask me what film I was working on. And it was so difficult for me to try to un explain. And I think the more that we can start young with basic literacy, um, the last week uh, we can say is Kathy O'Neill, um, the more that we can sort of stop this, um, to use Kathy O'Neill's um, quote, this blind faith that we have in big data. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that is also questioning the tech, what Meredith Broussard Curl calls techno solutionism, this idea that a technological solution is always the best solution. And you see that happening even with this, um, with the COVID-19 crisis, where you have Google and Apple rushing in and saying, we've got this contact tracing done, you know, thing done. We just need a special app and we know, need to know every single place you go and every single person you interact with. And then if you look at the communities who are hardest hit by COVID, they are communities of color and older people, um, both of which may not be um, communities that have the highest you know, rates of using high-tech apps. And we know with the Ebola crisis that trust building and human interaction was so critical in building the trust necessary for that contact tracing process. And so some of it is that... Um, that, that early literacy really gives us the power to question, to ask, ask questions and to be critical of these systems. Um, and, and, to, and, and to have that question that, that um, Namita was talking about with, with Trine Moran, this moment where you can say, something's not right here. Yeah, that's such a great point. And, and Namita, if you wanna add anything here, um, I know your, your passion has been to use the court system, um, you know, as a as a tool for advocacy and reform, and that is clearly going on here as well. And you know, we were we were talking the other day, saying, you know, this is really a problem that you 
I think need to come at from both angles, both from the, the through the courts, through that kind of advocacy, changing, as you were saying, Shalini, you know, how our lawmakers are thinking about and informed about these issues, as well as the importance of the education side of the equation. So, Namitha, do you want to add anything here? No, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. okay listening to the audience. Thank you. Great, great, wonderful. So, um, let me keep going here. So, um, let's touch on these for a minute because people were curious about um, a few aspects of your filmmaking process, Shalini, and particularly, like, how did you get to the people you got to? So one question, these are, these are two different questions, is um, what led you to the apartment building um, where, uh, you know, you, you showed the ways in which face recognition is being used in that housing complex? How did you get that story? And the other question really has to do with, um, how risky was it for you to get the information from from China, uh, in particular, since they tend to be um, secretive and and not receptive to hearing critical things about um, you know techniques that they're using? Oh, access is a, is like sort of at the core of documentary um, filmmaking and. The more that I do it, the more that I realize what a privilege and an honor it is um, to be the custodian of people's stories. Um, in the case of the Brooklyn residents, a lot of these things were inter, inter um, woven in the sense that I didn't know that Kathy and Joy were friends and um, Kathy and Joy had both written a letter for the Brooklyn residents and the Brooklyn residents relied on Joy's research to question their system. And so Joy, uh, I mean, Trine uh, empowered herself by watching and reading Joy's articles and talks and said, well, wait a minute, this is, isn't even designed for my face. And, and so was able to empower herself with those tools. It's sort of that sprawling research. Um, I, I um, in China, it was a little, it was definitely tricky because um, I was just very committed to not causing harm to anyone. It's not that we thought that we couldn't get someone who would speak out against um, facial recognition. But as a filmmaker, I was also very concerned with keeping that person's safety. Um, um, that's it's it was very it would be very challenging so the person that we did get to speak on camera about it was actually in support of the system which gave us a, a completely different perspective um if we had more time and if i maybe spoke the language it might it might have been a, a a different sort of process um i'm not sure even that i would go to china again ever um with the with the system that they have in place, but that access was really uh, tricky, and I'm very conscientious about um, not causing harm to people, and I was worried about being able to keep someone who would share that information safe. So that was part of the decision making there, and in the sense of access, I think also each of the women that I interviewed, the letters that I wrote to them were so well researched. <laughs> I, I sort of wrote them these letters that were fangirl re letters that were like completely cited <laughs> of like who they are, what, why I'm fangirling them, why I need their voice in the film, you know, what is important here. And I think um, that that made a difference in who responded because I, I was fully like acknowledging just every single person in the film is just such a rock star to me and was such, I, I feel so grateful to the brilliant cast of the film for being able to translate that and giving me an education and in turn being able to share that education. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I think at the beginning you referred to them as a badass women, which uh, um, I think we can all relate to. So that's great. So we, we have, um, a number of questions that um, I would say have to do with this question of bias and how 
pervasive biases in in algorithms more broadly. And I think um, sort of to to try to summarize these into a, a single question, um, aren't aren't all algorithms biased in that they contain assumptions? Meaning there's there's nothing new in what any algorithm is doing. They're, they're, they're delineating a model of how they either think a system works or how they want a system to work or a model that is based on um, a desire to get us to behave in certain kinds of ways. And I just, uh, our audience has a lot of questions about that. So would love your, your thoughts there as well. Well, I, I, you know, I'm going to give you the non-data scientist as someone who's not a data scientist or mathematician and, 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 and didn't go to MIT, but, but the way that I've sort of, sort of compared it is we sort of think of AI as our gods and they're really more like our children. Um, they're more like a, a reflection of ourselves and even sometimes the flaws that we, uh, that we are, don't want them to pick up on, <laughs> they sometimes pick up on. And um, I often pose this question to data scientists, which is, is there a flaw just in thinking that we can train um, systems from a past that is ridden with historical inequalities to predict the future? And isn't that just a deterministic model? And I think that the way that I've, um, the way that this has been explained to me um, is that we can control for bias in certain settings, but it's also not over promising what the, what the algorithm is meant to do. And so um, Joy compares it to hygiene that you don't just take care of it on one day and say, oh, we just did that and it's done. It's sort of something that you have to perpetually do throughout the process. Um, I also know that, you know, it's not lay people who can do this. When, when, when Kathy O'Neill talks about creating an FDA for algorithms, it is because we need people like Kathy O'Neill in the room who are well qualified to talk about, is this system biased? Is it not biased? Um, for whom could the system fail? How could it be abused by a third party, um, by um, sort of nefarious actors? Um, and, and where we are is in a system, like I often liken to it when we had the automobile, but we had no seatbelts and no car seats and no rules in place. And that's where we are. There's no warning label. There's no usage. There's no um, way of saying this is the way it should be used. You actually had police departments putting in pictures of drawing pictures of Woody Harrelson to find a police sus suspect. And so to me, um, sort of the, the, the answer would be to have this kind of review process um, before it's deployed massively around the world and available to our children, that there should be some sort of review process and that we should have some protections on our data. Because I think part of this is that we, don't have any models of what AI could look like for public good because we've had this stunning lack of imagination because companies like Google and um, Facebook have taught us that the only way this can function is for them getting unfettered access to our data in an unlimited way where we have no recourse and we have no financial benefit. And they are using our data to train their systems. And so at every step of the process, we need more checks and balances in place. And, and, and I am in favor of sort of an FDA for algorithms that would um, consist of, you know, technologists like Kathy O'Neill, um, outside ethicists, um, and people do, who don't have an economic stake in the deployment of, of these technologies who, who, who submit them for independent review. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I, you know, I grew up in an era where um, 
the warning on cigarette labels came to life. And your your analogy there, um, you know, the the sort of warning label idea, um, it, it strikes me as as very compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, we had another question, which was, you know, this is such a vast, complicated issue. How how you know you're succeeding? But I I think you answered that um, in in your last. Um, set of comments. So um, I want to turn to one final question before we wrap up, which is really a a question about um, your documentary um, filmmaking process. And and, um, this member of the audience um, asks you, what's what's the most difficult part of making a documentary? And, um, you know, what's most challenging and what is most exciting? So we'll we'll give you the last word on that. Oh, thank you. Well, there's I always I always joke when people ask me what was most challenging, and I was like, I don't think there's anything that's that easy <laughs> with documentary. I think that um, the hardest part is actually story structure. I think you can watch coded coded bias and be like, okay, this makes sense. This has a thing that I can follow, and that is just years of your life where you're just trying to say, does this make sense? And testing it before audiences that does it make sense? Um, but I, but, but just to end on a on a hopeful note, uh, what is most empowering for me and why I make documentaries is that it really does um, remind me that everyday people. Um, that there are heroes walking among us and that everyday people can make a difference. And I'm saying this as a, you know, black turtleneck wearing New Yorker in a very sort of unromantic, very logistical (laughs) kind of pragmatic way. And I have literally seen, um, you know, whether we're talking about Trine Moran and Icy Mae Downs, not just uh, stopping real-time facial recognition by their landlord in their building, but helping them um, put a legislation that would protect other residents in, in the state of New York uh, against the same harms, uh, whether it's um, a, 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 an incredible uh, middle school teacher like Daniel Santos, who if you're standing 10 feet away from him, no can feel his commitment and his passion for his students and um, the way that he was arbitrarily graded a bad teacher and still found a way to unite and fight this. And by the way, the value added model is still being used and that system was um, designed to evaluate fertility in bulls and we're using it to to grade teachers, this inhumane system to grade teachers. Um, And so, and, and seeing that they just not fought, but they won. And, um, and, you know, whether it's, you know, Joy, who's just game changed the conversation of an industry or three black women graduate student scientists who just, um, you know, help save our democracy (laughs) from invasive surveillance by law enforcement. And these are all small examples about how every day people can make a difference. And what it's made me realize is that it's not actually big tech that are our enemies in this. In fact, I think there are many conscientious people that work within big tech that need our support uh, for those moments that they're in the meeting and say something's not right here and they need our support. But But our biggest enemy is our own apathy and our own sort of disbelief that we can make a difference. And I think the cast of Coded Bias has reminded me that everyday people can make um, a huge amount of change, but what matters most is that we actually care enough to do just that. Yeah. Shalini, so inspiring. Thank you. Um, thank you for your passion and your advocacy. And Namitha, thank you for um, helping to shape this incredible event with us and, and being such a stunning interviewer. Such good questions, so thoughtful. And um, our thanks to, to the audience. I know we had a crowd on today's call. Thank you for all your questions and, and for joining us. And um, Good luck to all of us. There's lots of work to do. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye. It was an honor. Thank you. Thanks.